this was an idea that uh, was spawned during COVID isolation when our family came down with it, um, of a way to use my um, brain, but also having lived in Adelaide uh, for seven years and seen how Australia actually um, celebrates uh, its fossils and uh, paleontology as well. So New Zealand has... Um, national or uh, official or unofficial emblems. Um, we've got the silver fern that's been in use since the 1800s that you can see on uh, the netballers and the, the All Blacks jerseys, but we've also got um, our national bird, the kiwi. So you can kind of think of these as the, the national floral emblem uh, and the national uh, animal emblem. But why don't we actually have a national um fossil um, emblem given we have a really really rich and um, quite amazing uh, fossil record so emblems started in uh, the US with, with different states having them and then got picked up um, by Australia so the emblems are different to the animals that you find on the coat of arms so if we take South Australia where I lived uh, for seven years it's got a national um, floral emblem, the Sturt Desert Pea that uh, comes out in the desert after a whole lot of rain. You've got um, uh, the faunal emblem, so the Southern Hairy Nose Wombat. You've got a marine emblem, so the Weedy Sea Dragon that you can uh, go snorkeling off the jetties um, in South Australia and see. You've got uh, the fossil emblem that I'll talk about at the moment, so Sprigina. Uh, from the Ediacaran fauna of the Flinders Ranges. You have um, a mineral emblem so this is uh bornite and they have a gemstone uh emblem so in this case opal um which you can find in jewelry shops but also uh the famous opalized fossils and op opalized dinosaurs and they've just announced actually um the state tartan but in 1995 um uh western australia petitioned to have um, a, a fossil emblem to basically epitomize the natural history and fossil record of the state and uh, tell local stories. And this one wasn't a public vote, but um, the emblem ended up being a 380 million year old Devonian uh, fossil fish from uh, Gogo. So that's those uh, famous fossils that you can find in nodules that you can dissolve out and you get exquisite uh, 3D preservation and now with new techniques you can see uh, nerves and umbilical cords and placentas and um, baby fish and so this was picked up um, throughout the rest of Australia with a series of public votes so South Australia uh, chose um, the 560 million year old Sprigina fossil from the Ediacaran fauna uh, from the Flinders Ranges and so Sprigina is from the dawn of complex life before the Ediacaran um, explosion made famous by the Burgess Shale. And Sprigine is one of the first animals which has got um, bilateral symmetry. So your left and right sides mirror each other like ours do today. New South Wales picked uh, the 365 million year old lobed finned fish um, from the Devonian. Uh, and very recently, uh, Victoria's picked the 100. Uh, 25 million year old Clulosuchus um, fossil. So this is a, a, a giant um, predatory amphibian. And the most recent one uh, to get picked uh, is the ACT is actually picked um, a trilobite, which you can find in the fossil record from about 450 to 250 million years ago in um, the ACT. Now, Queensland, um, which also help me think we should actually be doing this in New Zealand is currently going through the nomination process. So they have a really cool website where it gives a bit of the idea of um, why they want a fossil emblem and it's got 12 candidates. So there's a um, mineralized flower fossil, there's a sea lily, there's a monotreme, a crocodile, and then the rest is all made up of um, extinct marine reptiles and dinosaurs, which is what um, Queensland is famous for but these are all picked to basically as i was saying before epitomize the the natural history um, of the regions and the really cool local stories that uh fossils can tell so new zealand has this really rich fossil record um and 
having a fossil emblem would be a really good way to, for, for um, educational outreach through um, developing educational materials, like through the New Zealand Science um, Learning Hub, which if you ever write blogs, they will quite invariably contact you to turn those into kete or baskets um, uh, for teaching. But uh, educational outreach with... Um, uh, school kids uh, with uh, like International Fossil Day, which was an idea that um, James talked to me about, but also with um, like outreach through museums as fossils can be a really good way to teach our local stories and how our um, Tonga species or our wildlife, um, our, our flora and fauna through millions of years adapted to New Zealand's um, really dynamic um, geological and climactic um Record. So you can see here there's a lot of uh, changes in the um, geology and land area of New Zealand, but also climactic changes as you go from uh, cold glacials to warm uh, interglacials. And so this fossil record, we could tell stories right back from some of our oldest fossils, like um, the 505 million year old trilobites from uh, Trilobite Rock that I remember going to see as a kid in Golden Bay, um, right through to the more recent end of the time scale where um, we've got Holocene fossils where we can get ancient DNA and actually really drill down into how these animals responded to um, climate change and human um, impact. But it's also a rich fossil record where, um, no offense, a lot of our geologists, uh, not geologists, paleontologists are getting old, they're retiring, and due to a, a chronic lack of underfunding, we're not actually being re replaced. And there's there's not the funding available to be able to excavate new sites that um, appear and erode before um, our eyes. But um, emblems can actually also help promote the need for fossil protection or fossil protection strategy. So I plugged um, to Daphne and Lee's new book, which has actually got a really good write-up in the latest issue of New Zealand Geographic that's coming out, uh, Daphne says, at the end of August, is we could use fossil emblems to promote the need for protection of um, fossils. So one candidate for an emblem could be uh, the humble fossil leaves or uh, hundreds of fossil leaves from Foldemar that give us a really good detailed climactic record. And one of the cool things about those leaves is uh, you can look at the, the stomata and the size of the stomata and how much oxygen was in the atmosphere and what was the temperature. Um, and it can really instill in, in the public uh, a need to protect sites like the, the campaign that we use to protect um, Foldemar. And hopefully the DCC actually buys it and protects it. But fossil emblems can actually also help um, protect fossils. So at the other end of the time scales, we've got... Um, the illegal excavation of moa bones from archaeological sites, from fossil sites that have been traded uh, uh, on online auction sites like Trade Me or sold for tens of thousands of dollars at auction houses like we have um, here in Dunedin, where they've got complete moa skeletons for sale that have two left um, feet. Is just using that the emblem and the campaign to choose the emblem about the need for protection of fossils and educating the public. And if we didn't actually have a public educated about the importance of paleontology, then discoveries like the the Moa footprints on uh, the Kyburn River, or the ones that were discovered uh, in Auckland very recently, is um, they could have been uh, excavated by uh, amateur paleontologists that didn't know how to um, excavate, or they could have been um, uplifted. Uh, and taken into private collections or, or sold, much like um, has happened with uh, footprint sites in the Kimberley um, of Australia. And so this is also about when these new sites actually get discovered, is so being able to let the paleontologists um, uh, know that we've actually got these sites that need uh, excavating as well. But emblems are also really good at um, promoting um, fossil tourism. And this is where I think Australia does really, really well, um, where you've got museums built into some of the, the biggest fossil sites. So in Winton in Queensland, you've got the Australian Age of Dinosaurs, and you can actually go volunteer there on digs as members of um, uh, the public. You've got Cronosaurus Corner in Richmond, also in Queensland, where uh it's got a built-in museum. It's got its own uh, paleontologist um, on staff who do, who, who do research and go and excavate sites around um, 
uh, the region, but Cronosaurus Corn has also got an area where families can take their kids to go excavate. Um, and you'll find small fossils, and invariably they sometimes stumble across a complete um, Platypterygius uh, ichthyosaur. And in South Australia, where I lived um, for seven years, you've, you've got Narracourt Caves. So this is World Heritage Site, lots and lots of caves, really cool paleontological story that, that run tours and talk about the caves and the, the excavations that Rod Wells um, did there. And the, the, you can see thylacolea, marsupial line skeletons down uh, in the caves. And there's the chance of this in, in New Zealand, like utilizing what we've got, but also building um uh, upon the fossil tourism we've got with with this campaign for an emblem and the use of emblems so we have the Waitomo um caves museum and all the exquisite fossil record um around there but also the Operara river valley so that whole area of the west coast from Operara down through Karamea uh into Westport about halfway down to Greymouth is just full of caves with moa bones um and really good uh, opportunities for fossil tourism there are, there is some there already but it's it's quite um small scale uh closer to home down here you've got the Waitaki Whitestone Geopark um which is in the process of trying to be um internationally recognized and you've also got Foldemar which in, in the early days of the campaign to save it there was talk of could we include Foldemar in the Waikiki Whitestone Geopark but also there was discussions of maybe we could have a local museum there you could actually have scientific excavations you could have an area that families could take um their kids to excavate and find um fossils and I remember going there on a the field trip for the Southern Connections um Congress and had a really good um fun time so with all that in mind and a good case of why we should have emblems to to talk about our, our local stories um about how our um flora and fauna adapted to New Zealand's ever-changing conditions but for educational outreach and protection of fossils and uh fossil tourism is we do need to choose an emblem and there's a lot of things we need to think about so we could go for something flashy we could go for Haast Eagle um if you think of like the Eagles out of Lord of the Rings so Haast Eagle is ancestors are the smallest eagles in the world, the little eagle and booted eagle that arrived here two and a half million years ago and evolved very rapidly into the world's largest eagle. We could go for what's affectionately called down here Shagasaurus, the 75 million year old plesiosaur um, Kaifekia, which is on display um, in the Targa Museum in Ewan Fordyce uh, has studied with South American colleagues. Or we could go for the shark toothed dolphin, which is a whole group of um, fairly large predatory dolphins that haven't been described as yet, but are kind of quintessentially uh, New Zealand. Um, maybe size matters. Um, we could go for Beachy's penguin. Alan Tennyson described and named after his mum. So this giant penguin that is about um, 55 to 60 million years old that shows that penguins really rapidly filled um, the niche for marine predators after the extinction of um, the marine reptiles. Um, we could go the classic South Island giant mower or just mower in general so we don't split a vote that I'll talk about um, soon. Or maybe some of the smallest. Um, so the the trilobites that are 505 million years old. And it's some of the questions that we need to think about of do we actually want a fossil emblem to be after New Zealand split from Gondwana or can we include ones when uh, Zealandia was still attached to eastern uh, Gondwana but have been found in New Zealand. So it gets to the discussion of how quintessentially New Zealand do we want these emblems. But maybe we want historical value. So I grew up reading Valley of the Dragons um, by Joan Whiffen and absolutely loved it. So maybe we want to pick the first dinosaur fossil she found or this Mosasaur skull up the back of Hawke's Bay prognathodon. Uh, or scientific value, maybe that prevails. So um, we could pick sub-fossils of um, uh, the Pupu Harakiki, the flax snail, that are all throughout Northland dunes that uh, are really giving us whole information about how animals adapt to climate change or human impact. Um, so do we want a fossil emblem uh, for a species that's still around, but we've actually got a really rich sub-fossil record? Um, and if that's not the case, maybe we pick the ancestor that's been described recently um, from the excavations in Auckland that uh, Auckland Museum has been involved in. But we need to think about um, 
a lot of these fossils that uh, we've got is people are members of the public aren't going to be able to find them. So maybe we need to pick um, a fossil that our tamariki or kids can find. So I've actually got a, a copy of uh, Marion and James Kiwi Fossil Hunters Handbook that my kids absolutely love. We could pick um, a fossil out of there, and there, there are uh, possibilities. Maybe the Trisic Minota skull that um, is the emblem of the New Zealand Geological Society, or some of the giant crabs that you actually find at Muttanau Beach and Glenafric Beach in uh, North Canterbury that I remember going collecting with my dad um, as a kid. So where do we go from here? So what we've got um, is all of these institutions, uh, and more truthfully, scientists from these institutions are all on board um, this initiative. Um, and we're going to be forming a committee to... Uh, answer some of these questions and getting feedback from you guys tonight will be really good. Um, so we're looking at sign a shortlist. So we're, we're wanting to have representation across uh, the universities, the CRIs, the museums, the special interest groups like um, this one across uh, Maori as well and all facets um, as, uh, of paleontology, but especially taxonomic expertise um, as well and there, there are quite a few things we need to think about so how many candidates do we want so queensland's currently got 10 to 12 candidates um if we're going to have that we need to cover the taxonomic range of fossils so we need our invertebrates um so our our mollusks our insects um plants fish birds uh dinosaurs marine reptiles um covered so uh we're not getting an absolute bias of um birds as our fossil emblem and i think um it's a it's a good point that dan was raising when i was talking to him if we want each candidate to be an emblem in its own right and we don't want them to be competing against each other so if you're going to have a mower just have mower as opposed to four different mowers. so you don't want to split the vote and end up with what we had with the new zealand flag referendum where you had the new zealand flag versus three other candidates that look really really similar um how many emblems once uh, we've had this public voting process? Do we want one national emblem? Do we want the main lane versus the North Island? Have some North Island, South Island rivalry. Or do we want to go regional emblems? So Northland could have one or Auckland, um, Canterbury or Otago. Um, personally, I think the length of the reign of emblem could be about five to 10 years because paleontology in New Zealand with all the new discoveries that have been made is... Um, maybe the emblem goes out of date and we, we want to re refresh it to take into account all of these new um, discoveries. So the idea is once we actually have um, a shortlist is to launch a public vote. This could be on National Fossil Day this year if, if that lead in time works or we could uh, launch it um, early next year and maybe announce it on National Fossil Day uh, next year. But what I'd like to actually do is have our 10 to 12 candidates get some paleo art done. Uh, we could talk to Giselle Clarkson, who does some of the really good artwork in uh, New Zealand Geographic, or Simone Daniels, PhD student, who did um, really good artwork of Catcher and a Shell Duck, uh, the Mycene uh, duck that we described recently that really captured the public attention. Um, have information on each candidate so you could click on the, the, these paleo art of each of the candidates and you go to a page and it tells you all this information um, and that you can then actually nominate on the website and I'll keep track in the background. So we need to do website um, development. So I'm going to talk to Otago University to see if they're interested. I'll talk to De Papa um, to see if these places would like um, to do some of this website development um, pro bono. But also once we've got candidates is um having institutions or individuals being able to champion these candidates so um maybe auckland if we if it turned out though maybe auckland museum wants to get behind the the plaque stylus relative or canterbury museum wants to get them behind the giant um fossil crabs so yeah it's really about what you guys think um we'll, we'll take everything on board and really for me it's whatever becomes the emblem to me doesn't really mattered it's definitely cool to have an emblem but it's more about being able to just educate the the, the public and actually do a whole lot of really cool paleontology outreach